herbicide treatments were applied to the treatment plots in March and in May of 2012. In June of 2012, on the plots, we measured the density of goat grass. So that's how many goat grass plants were alive. We also counted dead ones. And then we also sampled composition. In, 2000, in 2012, we also, after we got the, the results from that, we found that the May treatments didn't work very well. They were probably applied too late. So in the subsequent year, which is 2013, in November, the three treatments were, were reapplied to the previous year's May treatment sites. And then, a, and that was in fall, in November of, of 2012. And then this year, in March of 2013, those treatments were, um, all the treatments were reapplied. But the idea behind this study was to, first of all, see if we could sort out some of the differences between site and year. But the main objectives of the project were to see, number one, if these herbicide treatments were effective in reducing the target species of barbed goat grass. But secondly, we were really concerned that the, uh, because the, we were working on serpentine, that the uh, treatments didn't significantly and adversely affect the serpentine um, plants. So there's two parts to it. One is the goat grass density, the other is density of, uh, of, of non-target species. And on page 15 at the bottom, you've got a graph. This is a very, this is a simplified report of the results. Um, on the x-axis, you've got the, the herbicide treatments, which are Fusillade, Coast, and Aquamaster, and then controls. We had controls for these. And then the y-axis is number of live goat grass plants that were present in, the, in June after the treatment year. And there are four columns on, on, each, on each spot which represent March 2012, May 2012, November 2012, and March 2000, 2013. The thing to see from this is that the, um, the two uh, herbicide treatments that are targeted at annual grasses were quite effective, especially in 2013. The November treatments killed all of the goat grass plants on the plots um, that were treated with fusillade and post. The Aquamaster didn't work quite as well, but the method of application was different. We broadcast the, um, the two uh, um, annual plant selective herbicides. The Aquamaster is applied in spot treatments, and one of the problems with this project was that I think you've gotten a hint at this, and you've worked with goat grass to understand this. It can be quite difficult to identify conclusively goat grass plants early in the vegetative stage. So the Aquamaster um, lack of effective treatments is probably mostly due to the spot treatment. Also, you'll notice on the right that number of goat grass plants on the control um, increased between the two years of two years of the study. So this is a, a that's at least on our, on our plots. Um, the take home message from this is, number one, that these, uh, the annual grass selective herbicides were very effective in reducing barbed growth grass on these plots, especially when applied in the fall. Um, previous, so that's number one. Number two, I'm, I've worked with goat grass before. I've worked with the East Bay Municipal Utility District on goat grass control. Um, and prescribed burning, two prescribed burns in a row can work really well with, with goat grass if you can get the two burns in, which is a problem. And also on this site, because we have a mixture of coast range grassland with a lot of biomass and a lot of fuels with the serpentine, the prescribed burning that was done by the, by the by marine parks didn't effectively carry through the serpentine. So, if you have goat grass on serpentine, the prescribed branding isn't going to work, even if you can get around the, the, the political issues. The third, so that's the second thing, is that burning is also an effective treatment that can work reasonably well. Final thing is that, um, and I'm not going to present the data here, but the community structure um, was altered through the 
with the use of the herbicides, but it was altered because the uh, selective herbicides killed annual grasses, including the goat grass and some of the exotic, exotic annuals. It had no effect on the community composition of serpentine. So on the serpentine sites, the goat grass was reduced just as effectively as it was on the non-serpentine sites. There wasn't an impact on, the, um, on those associated species. So this is a project where goat grass is still not completely controlled, but the, um, these two herbicides, fusillade and post, seem to work really well. They're going to be applied again this year. And it doesn't seem to have adverse effect on serpentine. So I think this offers real potential for controlling goat grass on these, on these serpentine, serpentine sites. All right. All right. Also, remember, we're just doing about five minutes here. You guys write down your questions. We'll have some opportunities to follow up with the speaker uh, as we go through uh, the Okay, so the general theme of what I'm going to discuss is developing uh, effective control methods. And almost everything, well, everything I do is with Guy Kaiser, who's here and uh, driving a vehicle. Chairman's going to talk about our collaborations with so many of the advisors that are here, the Cooperative Extension Advisors, probably seven or eight of you here that I've worked with. So all of this is a kind of a combination of a lot of different people. Um, work. And I'm going to start out by talking about Barb Goldcraft in one slide and then Medusa Head in the rest of them. And I'm going to sort of break it down into, you know, this one, I'll, I'll just talk about it all in one slide. The other ones will talk about mechanical, cultural, and chemical. And so uh, a couple of people have alluded to the fact for barbed grass that prescribed burning can be effective and the timing uh, is, you know, again, right there when the, when the, the seed heads are exposed. Oh, you okay? Oh. 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 Again, see, that's, Rob probably did it because he did it for just his height. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, and, and it's uh, like Jamie just said that it's uh, it's a two-year program. Remember, I, I discussed out in the field about, and, and Kevin Rice discussed it too, that the seeds uh, survive two years uh, within that disarticulated uh, spike of that falls off. And so what we did with this is that we we had complete burns in the first year, but we didn't get any control in the second year because of that second seed. And then the second year. We had areas that didn't burn so well and areas that did burn well. And, and then the third year, you can come back in and see how well you, you got control. And those areas that burned really well in the second year, and the third year gave us great control. And those areas that didn't burn so well in the second year, because it was too patchy, didn't give us good control in the third year. So you need more than one year of, of control, particularly this case, burn control to get effective control. <coughs> We went back three years after the burn and we looked at those plots. And even in these plots right in here, we still had 85% control. So um, it held out fairly well. And I mean, obviously, in the long term, you have to do something else but, uh, to keep up that control. But it, it did do pretty well doing the burning. But it has to be more than one year. And I think at least you can talk about one year. That, one year looks good, but the next year doesn't. We've, looked, we've been looking at a, a new herbicide uh, called aminocycle pyrochlor, and actually Stephen Colbert is here. Where are you, Stephen? Right here. Right here. And he's a uh, DuPont, works with DuPont, and from what I understand, this product is going to be registered in December, the beginning of the year. That's what they say. Of course, they say that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's perspective, right? One that'll be registered. The one that'll be registered, yeah. And so this is normally a broadly uh, selective herbicide, extremely well on any thistles, including yellow star thistle. But we've been looking at it also uh, with respect to controlling uh, bark goat grass. And it didn't do much with Medusa head at all. But bark goat grass has seemed to work fairly well. This is with Josh Davey who did this. And we were able to, in fact, the, the, the I wish perspective was the best word, but it's actually the product alone. Perspective is a combination of amino cycle, pyrochlor, and or, or sulfur. But the product alone gave us almost complete control, 99.5%, and really stimulated other more desirable annual grasses compared to 100%. So 
So this was another possibility uh, in the way of chemical control, but we haven't worked this out entirely. We haven't been able to replicate this uh, consistently from year to year. Now we've looked at uh, Medusa head control and the rest of the free slide from Medusa head. And, and burning was uh, one of our, our first studies that we, we worked on. And we had read that burning didn't work at all in Lassen County. This is some work that Jim Young did with USDA. Uh, but we had heard in other areas it worked really well. So we used different sites up and down the state, the southern part of the state, around you know, where we live, a little farther north in Siskiyou, and then up in Lassen where they have the, the longest the winter, the shortest uh, growing season. And, uh, and not everywhere did burning work well. And when we tried to figure out why this was the case, it really came down to how much uh, fine fuel there was. If you had more fine fuel, uh, your burn was hotter and slower, and you were able to kill the seed. If you had very little fine fuel, like in Lassen County, which had the, the least amount of fine fuels, uh, this actually should be the opposite here. Sorry, I should have moved it. Lassen is here, Fresno is here. Uh, the highest amount here would be Fresno County, who had the best burn and, in fact, got complete control. So uh, we've been talking about this in the field. We've also, and you've heard about this study, because Morgan talked about it, because this was a collaboration with Morgan and Emilio Alto and Mel George, and John, of course, where we looked at more timely grazing, and, and just to point this out, oh, uh, before I get there, also removing that thatch layer, that was an important uh, component, because as I told you in the field, the thatch layer really makes Medusa head competitive. So when you till out the thatch layer and you come back the next year, you go from about 38% uh, cover to 18% cover. And that's for doing nothing else but killing. So getting rid of the thatch can reduce the boost of that. Um, when we did the burning here, though, we, there we go. Um, I mean, the, the grazing in here, you can see again, this is the same graph that Morgan showed, that May grazing, that late April, early May grazing was the best timing. <coughs> The Medusa had used up most of the water. It hadn't produced viable seed. It would still be eaten by the animals. Not only did we get very good control, we repeated this two years in a row with the same results, uh, but we also got a stimulation in our native broadleaf species. In this particular case. So, uh, so that was the right timing. If we burned in September, nothing. If we burned too early, nothing. And in the field, a lot of us talked about this. We burned too early, it recovers. You burn, you, I mean, if you graze too early, it recovers. If you graze too late, uh, you're really not doing a whole lot because the seeds are already on. And my last slide, uh, herbicide control. And <clears throat> we're looking at uh, different things up in Lassen County. This is Rob Wilson. We were looking at uh, glyphosate at very low concentrations and just the right timing. And we, figured, we felt that the right timing was mid-season uh, when the plant was uh, not uh, in the uh, just short of the dough stage in this particular case, but beyond the, the seedling stage, we were able to get 100% control at about six ounces of Roundup. And when you calculate out the cost of Roundup right now, that's about a 50 cents an acre application. I mean, I remember when I started this, the <laughs> rancher said, "We can't do anything that's that's over five dollars an acre." and we were telling them, we can't do anything under $10 an acre. And because of the price of ground that was dropped so much from the soft patent, we can do this now at 50 to 75 cents an acre. So the timing is just right, but this is an option here using Roundup in some of these trading areas. We're also using uh, amino perlin. And um, by the way, when I talk about uh, perspective, uh, it works great on barbed oak grass, but not on Medusa. And when we talk about amino perlin, which is this one, which is milestone, it, doesn't, it does not work on barbed oak grass, but works very good on Medusa. In this case, uh, we have to go to fairly high rates, one, uh, but we, in all three areas, winners, right around here, and red bluff, uh, we got very good control in this, this should say, 14 ounces. Uh, 14 ounces is a spot application. We also look at some other compounds that uh, are being used in, in rangelands uh, in the West and plateau, which is not registered in California. They're used in other areas of the West. Works. Matrix, which is 
the new DuPont product, or not, it's not a new product, but the new Rangeland worked very well, and also the DuPont product Landmark combination of sulfometron and sulfuron also worked really well. So there, there are some chemical options. What, uh, what Guy Kaiser and Josh are doing right now is they have a new project with a USDA scientist out of Montana who is looking at this compound right in here, Milestone, at lower rates, which is not going to kill Medusa head, but it's, it seems to show in a greenhouse that it completely eliminates seed production. And that might be the best of both worlds, is that you still have some forage capacity, you still can prevent a little bit of erosion, but you completely eliminate uh, new seed production to add to the seed bank the next year. So that's a, uh, an experiment that's going on right here and in uh, Bobcat Ranch, and I believe, in uh, Winters, and also in Tehama County where Josh is. So those are the types of experiments that we have going. Now, where do we go in the future? Will we have these kind of tools? It's to see how we can put them together in an integrated approach to get long-term management, sustainable management, while enhancing what we're trying to do um, the more desirable species. So that, that's where we are on that. Thank you very much, Joe. We'll have time for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Teresa Bichetti. <laughs>
So looking at, when we went out to the um, deer monitoring the spring after we did our fertilization, I, was, I think I was the first one doing it, and I'm going through the flocks, and I'm getting a high percentage of Medusa in it. But the Medusa had been very, very it's pretty much down to the ground. So we had a new variable while we were out in the field, and it percent to graze Medusa head. Because I would have flocks with still 78% Medusa in my meter square, but 95% of that Medusa had been grazed to the ground, and no seed had developed. So looking at that, again, we sort of flipped it on you here. Um, we had a significant difference. Again, our spring versus fall really didn't seem to matter too much, but the more fertilizer we put out, the more of a difference we saw compared to our control. So to me, this, I'm really hoping, a lot of us in this session we talk about different management practices. This is sort of my favorite one that I think is practical for almost every rancher out there, and it's economically feasible. You go out and you spread fertilizer, you're going to grow more grass, have more pounds of calf come off whether you're running stockers or pears. Um, and what I think is really interesting, Josh and I had our like I said, a couple of years in the management grant where we went through some drought cycles and some really wet El Nino years. We saw that, <coughs> that on our drought years is when we really saw a difference in um, the fertilizer making an impact and reducing um, the amount of food we The really wet years, there was too much feed out there, not enough animals, and we saw zero difference in the number. So to me, what we're seeing here is our spring versus our fall, not a big difference. We can recommend to ranchers to go out and fertilize with um, nitrogen, whatever nitrogen source you can get. Do it in the spring. Do it in February. My guys, where I'm at, we've got a lot of heavy clay soil. They'll tell me I'm crazy. We're going to get stuck. We can't go out. There. But the years where we see, we see that it makes a difference on fertilizing <coughs> is the drier years, where you can get out there in the spring. So instead of gambling in the fall and wondering if it's going to be a wet year or a dry year, wait until February. We already know if we're in a drought situation or if we're in an El Nino year. El Nino year, wait to save your time and money and effort. Wait until another year because unless you can really triple or quadruple your number of clouds are coming through, you're not going to see an impact. And then we looked at, um, we should be already at uh, forage production in, in May. And we definitely, as we looked at, um, down here is our control page. We had the most forage production. Our controlled plot was grazed. And then up here in our 60 pounds, uh, 30 pounds for our grazed plot. So you can see how much utilization you're getting on this. We go from roughly 1,800 pounds of production in our control plots utilization down to the um, to almost 1,100 pounds. So we really were getting those livestock to utilize those new descent plots. They were grazing the we're going to keep looking at this. We're getting ready to fertilize again for our second year. We're going to get, again, the fall and spring. We're going to do split plots. We can look at if there's any residual carryover from last year or future years. And we're also looking at um, long term. We saw results of it being grazed, plus sea head. We want to look, and as we mentioned earlier, long term, how is this working out? Um, there's one other point I see you getting ready to stand up. No, I'm here, so. <laughs> um, but that's, that's the basic story that we think it's working, we think it can be really practical, and something that almost everybody can do out of their range maps. And then we're, well, the other thing I forgot to mention, we did go and grab the new set of samples for all of these plots, um, sites, and we're having them right now that are being analyzed for web chemistry, because we, we're pretty darn sure we're increasing our protein, because um, so we're making more power for forage. So we're going to have the wet chemistry to deal with that. Um, but, you know, we've had a lot of discussion about trying to degrade whether or not they gain on it. If we can fertilize it and improve the production, improve the quality on that grass, now is it a weed or is it another resource that we can have to degrade? So. Okay, next speaker up is Josh Davey. One thing just to mention on um, Teresa's presentation in, in looking through those, those slides with all the data and all the sites combined is that some, there's one. in that analysis uh, quick run before we have Emilio. Uh, 
whether it's year length, what the stocking rate was, and how heavy it was hit, particularly during that window that Joe was talking about. Uh, that number was different sites, particularly one site that comes to mind is here at, at uh, Sierra. Uh, at that certain window point, the stocking rate was extremely low compared to the normally stocked rates that some of the other ranches had. And that rate has a lot to do with whether there was a significant difference or not. So actually, if you put the sites in that were grazed more normally on how the ranch was season-wise, the uh, differences, significant differences in, in Medusa head as far as grazing and the composition are, the, the difference is quite a bit more, uh, like uh, one-third as much in some of the, the heavier grazed spots versus the control stuff. That's one part that's, that's not in there, but we'll have that out to you. This project is another part of the Rustici funded project that goes right along with, with that. Uh, and the idea on this was to try to take a long-term approach in terms of, of control. So essentially what we're doing is we're saying, all right, here's a weed. We will chemically control it, period, to the best of our ability. And then we'll put something there we want. And then we'll look at how well that um, forage that we put in can compete as far as can it withstand the reinvasion? Uh, what is the forage production? Because what, what our cows want to know is how much more does it produce? Can it better produce more than Medusa head? Will the cows eat it? And uh, does it have the ability to survive once it's actually established and in? Uh, and as Teresa mentioned, there's nine sites on this project. I've highlighted the ones that, that we have that are successful there uh, as far as how these seedings went. Uh, and we'll get to why, why they were or why they weren't uh, necessarily successful. Uh, the, from sites three till nine, those are all in uh, annual rangeland. Uh, I'd say foothill type. The top two sites are obviously more intermountain climate, and have a different uh, seeding strategy than what we used on the sites that were more down here in the valley. We put in uh, five different perennial grasses. And one annual grass mix, it was a rye grass and bondo brown, so soft chest mix. And we also had a control of them. Uh, one of the uh, perennial grasses was native, the others were introduced. All of the perennial grasses are summer dormant uh, with a lack of moisture or with uh, daylight, depending on, on the variety. Uh, timeline so, what did we actually do? So, for weed control to try to get this done, we sprayed in the spring, so in this, this case it was the spring of 2011, we sprayed with Roundup before plants were able to actually make seed, uh, so we killed the plants that were there plus the seed that they would produce. Then the next fall, after germination, we went through and sprayed them again with Roundup, so we have really good weed control. Uh, in fact, the last slide shows it. Let's just go back. Uh, if you take a look at, at all the sites combined as far as what our, our percent of Medusa head was, uh, notice the treatment doesn't matter, obviously because if they're, they're just finishing their first year. Uh, but we knocked Medusa head on an average from all sites combined from 27%. Obviously some had very little, others had a lot. Uh, we knocked that number down to 2, 3, 4 percent. The fact that deviations make it not even different than zero. There's probably one or two sites that make those numbers even, even uh, negligible. Uh, so pretty much in year one, we gave these plants full opportunity to establish without competition. After we did a fall application of glyphosate, we um, seeded the plots. Uh, five of the nine plots were drilled. Thank you, Rob Wilson, for letting me tell you to drill all over California. And uh, the other plots were harrowed uh, at, at seeding. And then we allowed the plots once they were seeded to fully establish. So the whole thing was, uh, we're giving you your best chance uh, initially. So we did not graze the plots the first year. We did a broadleaf application of 2,4-D, and in most cases, transline in the spring uh, for broadleaf weed control. And then um, last spring, we've evaluated all the plots. So we're going to measure. Uh, as we're going into it, uh, we only did production on the annual plots, on the annual grass planting versus the control. We didn't do production on the perennials because they didn't produce anything. Uh, we'll do quality sampling. We have plant counts as far as plants per square foot, so we can tell you in the future how well do they survive. Uh, what we look at right now, uh, 
uh, in terms of because most of these are, are a perennial mix, so give me a bunch of results the first year where we just planted them last year and had a spring and monitor them. Hopefully we can give you better results as we go down. But uh, essentially what we're finding from our, our initial planning is that I mentioned uh, we had five to nine sites successful. Of those sites, every single one of them that we drill at this point looks successful, including Royce's in, in Parkfield that had, what, two inches of rain after we planted it. Uh, and we're essentially owing that to uh, the weed control that we had in advance. Uh, if you'll look in the, in the chart here, it says 3, 5, 5, 5, 6, 8, and 12. That's the plants per square foot. What I'm using right now is a figure, and John, you can correct me if I'm wrong. If I have one to four plants per square foot, so if I'm above two, I, I feel that I have the density, but once those things fill in, uh, they should be square foot of base, particularly the perennial plants. Uh, so I should have the opportunity to have a successful stand. So at this point, five of the nine sites look successful as far as having the plants there. Uh, most of them look good enough to, uh, I'm assuming they made it through the summer, but we'll uh, keep a, on uh, evaluating that. Of the sites that we harrowed, we only had one successful site, and I attribute that to the rainfall that Hoplin gets, and probably our timing. We were really early, uh, giving it a chance to uh, come up while it was early, and maybe uh, a little bit of rain helped where other sites ran into troubles with things like seed cell contact. One site that we harrowed, even though we had good weed control when we harrowed it, um, we actually um, tilled it up enough that we brought up a, a weed crop of dry grass. Is that my time? Okay. <laughs> Perfect. So we'll continue to evaluate in the future. On uh, we have separate trials looking at these at these methods for establishing these guys, and we'll have results on how well they can compete to keep Medusa head out and try to give you some economics on them. Yeah, five minutes goes pretty fast when you're up here, and I have the uh, most unpopular job in the house. <coughs> Next speaker is Rob Wilson. Did you want to use this, Rob, or? Okay. Is the clock already rolling on his time? It is. <laughs> He's burning up. I'm going to be down to two or three. Well, I'll get started. No, you, you could wait. It's, we'll put a little leniency. So, my name is Rob Wilson, and uh, I have to start off by saying most. Sagebrush plant communities, different climate, different vegetation types than a lot of the rest of California. But most of my work's primarily focused on using herbicides to try and control annual grasses probably for the last eight years. I've done quite a bit of work with Joe and Guy and others looking at several different herbicides, different application rates, timings, and their effectiveness at controlling annual grasses. But we've also tried to do a lot of research looking at what are the effects of the herbicides on native vegetation and um, perennial grasses. We've also done quite a bit of work trying to reestablish native vegetation and perennial grasses in areas that have been invaded with weeds. And so we've worked with quite a few different weeds, but uh, we've done some recent studies with annual grasses. So instead of trying to go through all the different studies we did, I thought I'd pick one of the more recent studies we did at Clear Lake National Wildlife Park Refuge and just hit on some of the high points that we've been seeing. What we tried to do is take some of our most promising herbicide treatments and apply those um, to three different sites. 
At this particular National Wildlife Refuge, we had sites that were pretty unique that were primarily dominated by annual grasses that had just very sporadic perennial grass and they'd been burned, so there was no sagebrush component. We had areas in one study site that had a very healthy perennial grass stand, what we consider a healthy perennial grass stand, but had been burned and so we didn't have the sagebrush component. And then we had a third site where we still had intact sagebrush perennial grasses that had been invaded by Medusa. So we wanted to see how these treatments responded to the different uh, sites. And then on top of that, we did some revegetation treatments. So Joe talked about herbicides, and we've heard some talks about herbicides. I'm not going to go through what were the best herbicide treatments. The thing that I'll say is once you have the right application timing and rate, we're able to get very good weed control, or control of Medusa head, the year following treatment. Many times we can get 95 to 100% control of the annual grass that year following treatment. And on our sites with sagebrush and perennial grasses, the visual differences are quite dramatic that year following treatment. So this is an untreated versus fall slide uh, matrix. This is the site where we had good perennial grass and it did not have the sagebrush component. And then this is the site with the sagebrush. And so visually you see large differences. The big difference is that inner space between the perennial grasses and sagebrush that is normally dominated by Medusa head and cheatgrass, Japanese brome, now is bare ground. So one thing that we see is a lot more bare ground. If you don't have established perennial grass or sagebrush, it can look like a moonscape. You have 90% bare ground uh, type condition. But on these other sites where we have you know, desirable vegetation on site, it can be very quick results Say that, that's an amazing result. And then this is very glyphosate. So, we've been monitoring the effects of the herbicides not only on annual grasses, but the other vegetation. The thing I'll say from a forbs component is a lot of our annual forbs are suppressed the year of herbicide treatment, but then the following years they recover. <coughs> the thing that we've keyed in on is perennial forbs because they've been identified as very important for sage grass habitat. And what we see with a lot of the perennial forbs is they're not injured with the herbicides, and many times we see a release of those. They're increasing cover due to the lack of competition from the annual grasses. So this is a formation where visker root, which is released in a lot of our plots following herbicide treatment. The glyphosate story, though, there, there was one big disadvantage with the glyphosate is we did see quite a bit of injury on the glyphosate But these are just some of the forms that we saw that were not injured by the herbicides and actually released on herbicide. So, the big result I think I hit on it before was we had a lot of bare ground conditions. And our big question was can we go in and revegetate those areas and reestablish uh, some desirable perennials? So, we received the sagebrush perennial grass combination in half the plots. And the thing with sagebrush that we've seen quite interesting is where we treated with herbicides and controlled that annual grass component, we have, it does appear to see, increased our ability to increase sagebrush from seed. And the best success was areas that already had existing sagebrush. So a lot of that would just be natural improvement from the sagebrush. Perennial grasses, I wish I could have. Very disappointing for me at this site is we had some sites that now we had a good perennial grass component, we had a safe fresh component, but still the annual grass seemed to be rapidly reinvading. So, so, you know, I think I hit on most of these summary points, but the big question is 
is it possible to prevent reinvasion? And this, this is one of the plots that we had, and this would be sort of the ideal vegetation type on the side that we achieved year following. Really, that, that's where we have a lot of questions. You know, how, do you, how do you control the Medusa in long term? And if you reapply herbicides, we have done no local interventions there. So you start building up quite a bit of herbicide resistance and you your use for your emergency purposes. All right, thank you, Rob. The next speaker up is Sasha Roman. And we're making some good headway through this theme. And again, once we uh, looked at these uh, presentations, we're going to uh, have a discussion here and, and please take some questions and thoughts you guys have about these topics.
area. That's great, but you're still probably not going to get the dresses you want in the middle or forms you want in the middle because they're just not in keeping. Um, it might take longer to reinvade, but what are you going to be replacing it with? Um, this might be a case where it might make sense. In this case, uh, here we have the added green dots for desirable seed bank. Um, but if you're burning a small area and you have the the head in the surrounding dispersal edges, you're probably not going to have very long term success. In the next scenario, uh, this would be a, an early invasion, um, probably scenario that researchers would call a like early detection rapid response, where you see it right when it comes into your pasture, um, and we're wondering whether it would make more sense to try to burn just the edges, the edges of the patch, just a little bit beyond that versus burning an entire pasture. Um, of course, there are a few different factors that will go into this uh, cost, um, but also, so if you're burning in just the area that you have the invasion, maybe you're getting those uh, desirable species and the edges an advantage for uh, re-emerging in the center. And finally, we have one where you do a large burn in a large pasture that has both desirable and non-desirable species. And one of the interesting questions here is whether doing a large burn in this scenario actually gives you an extra benefit, where you create a barrier to the Medusa head in the center. Um, so that the in the middle of your burn, because it's so far away from where the Medusa head is, maybe you can get extra recruitment a little bit more resilience against the Medusa head in the future in the time that the Medusa head can't reach that burn center. Um, so we're hoping to look at these factors in my project um, early on, so I have no results for you today, but I'll give you a little summary of what the project will be doing. Um, this past summer, we did the pilot study Um, where we did a series of one square meter burns, and on some of them we weed whacked around the edges to limit dispersal of a, a little bit extra. Um, and we're looking at the results from these right now, and it really seems like it's in year one, we had very little dispersal, even at this tiny scale, getting into the center of that burn. Um, we don't have grazing happening on these burns, so that can be an impact. Um, but this is just a micro scale study from this project. Uh, in the last one's foothill, starting this uh, next year, we have um, two pastures that we're working in, which are each divided into two sections. One half will be grazed, and one half will be ungrazed, so we can look at the impact of grazing on this. Um, and we have three different size units, so 0.1 hectare, 1 hectare, Um, and we're, we'll be burning each of those sizes, three replicates in each, each side of each of the two pastures, um, hoping to get a better sense of what actually happens when you factor in burn size and scale in 
to uh, using fire management to look at specific heads. Maybe you can reverse each of the head thresholds and give the center of the burn area a chance to research with other effects of the site. Um, just like to wrap up saying thank you and acknowledging. Um, Next speaker is Emilio Laca. And those two people are Jody from Asso and Mel George. So they are they were co PIs with me in this proposal. Okay. Um, My version of the five minutes is to say probably three things. So here's the first. We know how to kill Medusa yet. For example, you cannot. Many other examples. Is the whole context surrounding that, and particularly the time that matters? So learn the technology of Medusa head and think of your application, whatever you do to kill it, in the context of the technology. We have identified a particularly susceptible stage, depending on what treatments you're going to use. And those are about between here and here. And depending if you extend a little bit, you can go up to here. At this point, the seed is already viable. Even if you cut the plant, it will fall and it will be able to grow. This is more or less the stage. Oh. 
Okay, grazing was just a second. Grazing seems to have been very effective. We were very glad to see that. However, <clears throat> ask about the density of animals and duration of the grazing and the size of the paddocks. It is nothing like what you can possibly use. But if you want to do it, you have the numbers right there printed in my handout. <clears throat> With the typical stocking density or stocking rates in annual range in California, do the numbers, you can apply proper grazing to control your losing head to about 1 to 3 percent of your land per year. <laughs> the third thing is that just like racing, cutting it, mowing it is very effective. It's actually a little bit more effective than grazing because you get a lot more control over it. People have done it. And in the fence was driving the tractor, some of producing stores. They was concerned about the cost and say, what the heck, I drive the tractor myself and I do it on the weekends for fun. So there you go. It kills it. That's an area that one of the producers followed in the previous year. It looked like this the previous year at the same phenological stage. It has about 4% reduced ahead of this year versus 40 plus per year. And this is an area that he was doing. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Okay, last speaker for this segment here is Glenn Nader. Well, it'll be tough to follow somebody as succinct as Dr. That is a tough one. First off, as you get older, you start to realize time is of a value. And you think 80 isn't that old. But I want to first say, I'm impressed with the group of people we have here. The level of knowledge, the level of field knowledge. Because as you also get older, you realize 
observations by people in the field, although they're not statistically set up, are very valid. In extension, we learn those are signals we need to pay attention to. So many of you don't realize the value you bring today. And I'm glad to see this great turnout. I'm glad that Jeremy's got a different approach because I was going to talk for two hours on an enzyme that you didn't care about. But I want to impress you with how smart I was about that damn enzyme. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. So uh, all I wanted to talk about is we, we talked about residual dry matter. And we know fires definitely affect how much litter or dry matter is left. And, and the point. This is a fire here at the station and changing and, and mostly wild oats afterwards and got rid of starkville soil in the same doing. So burns are typically telling us that removing the thatch or RDM gives us three to five years on Medusa head. And then there's some of the goat grass data from here. So we, can, we know that that driving part of the system is these plants, as you've heard, revolve around that. So you can see we had a five-year study here on the field station. First off, I'll say that just because we found something at one place in California doesn't mean it's replicatable or goes to your place. Okay, I'll, I'll admit that. But again, everything's a signal that you need to look at. So here we looked at different levels of our Pounds, these are pounds per acre. Uh, and then we also looked at slope and aspect for what kind of species showed up. Uh, and again, this is a fall treatment of RDM. Where we had going into the, the growing season. And then Dr. Tate Natwell had a water quality study looking at what was the effect of RDM on nutrient movements along with that, just as a side. So we can see through that data again um, that if you want to grow forbs, then what you really want to do is, and the sheep, old sheep people will tell you this, if you want a good fillery country, don't leave anything when you go in the way of live. And you're going to grow forbs. And you're going to grow uh, fillery. So again, there are some cues about why we're having certain species, and they're all related to residual dry matter. Same thing for clover. If you want to get rid of clover, leave a lot of litter on the ground and over five years just again I'm going to say every site's different but here at the, at the center I've been told I can't call it a station anymore it's a center so I'm trying old dogs are hard to change so here's Medusa head Line. I don't have standard air bars in there, but the, the point being at 300 pounds RDM and ungrazed, there's certainly a significant difference. Now that leads me, you can't see this poster up here, but the way I've always believed we get somewhere by all this interaction. If we can deconstruct it, what's going on. And part of the deconstruct is most of the time we manage into our problems. We refuse to want to manage out of it, but we manage where we get. And if you'll see here, my next point is that um, we're managing in because most cattlemen run out, what they want to do is store hay out in the field. So we tell them, leave a lot of RDM to come back to in the fall to get you to that next green season. And I've got the map over here that Mel George is 
somebody put together from one of the uh, from the San Joaquin research station. And it shows how RDM goes up and down. So in a sense, we've stockpiled RDM, and maybe we're managing our way to Medusa head by needing to have that production system where we stack up dry feed that, especially on a year like this, you're not going to see green feed till March. So those cows have to have something to subsist on, even if you give them protein supplement, until the green season comes till March. And then we get this huge flush of feed that we can't keep enough animals to keep up with. So again, Our management system is to leave that spring feed, get out of here in May or June, and have large amounts of biomass come through in the fall. We may just be managing ourselves into this problem. That's all I have to say. Thank you. All right. <laughs> well, that was terrific. We went through a good number of presentations there. Now we have the challenging task of Remembering a little bit about what you guys heard and getting your thoughts, questions, and opinions about the idea of taking our basic understanding of ecology, the science of these weeds, and making it translated into something that we can practically manage. So we ended talking about grazing, the timing of grazing, residual dry matter. Does anybody want to take us off from that and ask you their question or comment on using grazing animals or managing your rangeland and your dry matter for the use of it? That's a tough one. Okay. Is there a cost associated right here with grazing for control? That's how you tend to grazing? So the opportunity cost of high intensity grazing. Let's see, Ken. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good question, though. Did Emilio leave? Did he have that burning suit? I don't see any value associated with any control. Yeah, depends on where, what animals you're using and where they're coming from. I know on some of the treatments we've done, um, it costs you know three or four grand to cover a couple of acres if they had to truck them in. So, yeah, the, the herbicide we found is definitely the most effective you know, cost for a acre. Does anyone have a burning value? Uh, well, burning value. I mean, you know, you can get somebody to do it for you, like Hellfire. I tried to get to his figures and they haven't really been able to produce those, but it's well, and the other trick with burning for cost is that program where they're assessing all of us, what, $125 a year for yeah. every habitable dwelling we have? Cal Fire is actually going to get a chunk of that money. And the old BMP program that used to do cost share on controlled burns, that money is going to revert into doing controlled burns and likely less of a cost share and more of a Cal Fire funding to pay for all of it. So that would help the funding cost on the burn. The biggest problem that I see with the burn on most ranches is at $20 to $30 in AUM and you give up spring the year before you burn and the entire next year, unless it's great, maybe you can turn out on it again next March. That's a huge opportunity cost. That's a really good point. Uh, Roy, you want to take it? 
Uh, well, all kinds of different seeds, everything from just sub clover to ryegrass sub clover to perennial seeding. Cal Fire was involved, uh, but they did not have any personnel on it, but they didn't have time to do, uh, do an environmental impact report. Uh, but he, the battalion chief wrote us uh, a permit, said, you can burn, but we can't help you. So we had uh, the part of the fire department do it, and they loved it. How did it turn out? No. It went super good. Did you get good control? Huh? Did you get good control? We had perfect control. The key to a good burn, and especially in these hill grounds, not here necessarily, is a, is a fire break. And Charlie, were, Bruce Rominger did the fire break with a you know, huge disc and tractor. And uh, because of that, you, you can really control it with a few, few people. I think, right there, Gary's going to show some photos, I think, of it. 
I had a comment on burning. Normally, I work with the nation services that do a burn through Cal Fire, but both of them require a prescribed prescription. You can actually set out the goals and times and duration and intensity and, and all of that, which I fully think everything you contemplate and burn should be doing. I mean, why are you burning? Is, is the main question asked. And what components are you going to be working with afterwards in order to make this worthwhile? And in my case, we only burned once because we waited three years for the window to show up and would, affect, would not affect my endangered species, but would affect the So we couldn't do it in the second year. So, so. But you need the prescription before you need, before you can burn. It's not just go out and burn. One question I have, we talked a good amount about burning, but we also heard um, some of Emilio's work saying if you're going to actually control with grazing animals, the, the densities and the stocking rates we're looking at are, are inordinately high. But on the other hand, we know that's probably one of our most practical tools to maybe use it. So I'm interested to get your thoughts about the potential of using grazing animals and what you've seen in, in your experiences. Well, I, I want to know first what's high. Why can't it be done? And if, if, if in fact, it would be beneficial, because all of the stocking <coughs> densities I've heard on, in terms of what's going on here, are I, pretty low. And I graze pretty high density and in a, in a pretty good controlled environment. So if, if, if it can't be done here, if it's interesting to anybody, that's my typical management. It'd be fun to. See, and then and then I'd be willing to share what the costs are associated with with, how, with running the site density. When you when you're using the term density, what type of numbers are we talking here for everybody? I don't see Emilio. Uh, Morgan, had Morgan had them on. Morgan had eighty, didn't you? Morgan, yeah, uh, had eighty. Eighty at what? That's, that's a race. Just at Cal Cal for eighty. But the, uh, the, the density was was basically seven units per acre, so about seven thousand pounds per acre. That's true. And last summer I was raising seven hundred thousand pounds. For how long? Well, you can only raise that so long well, yeah, based on how much they consume. <laughs> but the higher density, the more.